Welcome to the Chronicles told by the Oracle. Cases of the missing, murdered, and unsolved. I'd like to thank everyone for joining me today, and don't forget, all source information for today's case can be found in the description box below. Be sure you hit that like and subscribe button so you never miss an episode. Let's get started with Chronicle number 41, the Stephen Craig Damon case, a Halloween mystery. Journey back to 1955. It was a year of the pocket-sized radio and the first wireless TV remote. The polio vaccine was discovered and the Cleveland Browns would be the NFL champs. Sadly, Albert Einstein would pass away. Perhaps you're heading out in your Bermuda shorts and jacket, cruising in your GM Chevy listening to Rock Around the Clock on your way to see Oklahoma or Rebel Without a Cause. Afterwards, heading home to have one of your mom's delicious casseroles, or perhaps some leftover beef stroganoff, listening to the Jack Benny show with your parents before watching the debut of the Mickey Mouse Club. 1955 was a year filled with new and exciting things. But it was a year of sadness for one family, of a two-and-a-half-year-old little boy who would vanish on Halloween, and to this day it is unknown what happened to him. Stephen Craig Damon was born on December 15, 1952, to parents Jerry and Marilyn. Stevie, as he was called by family, was a big brother to his seven-month-old sister, Pamela. Stevie was born in Iowa, but his family would move to East Meadow, New York, as Jerry was in the Air Force and worked at Mitchell Air Force Base, not too far away in Uniondale, New York. Stevie stood three foot two inches and weighed thirty-two pounds with blonde hair and blue eyes, with a small scar under his chin. Stevie was also born with a birthmark on his calf that resembled a mole. He had a healed fracture on his left arm. It is never stated how or when he broke it, though. On Monday, October 31, 1955, Jerry headed off to work, and Marilyn was going to the food fair mart to pick up some bread. Stevie was dressed in a blue polo shirt, blue dungarees, a red sweater with blue and white ships imprinted on it, with brown shoes. Pamela was in her pram or carriage, and the trio would set out to the food fair, which was within walking distance of their home, as it was only a block and a half away. When Marilyn and the children arrived, she parked the pram outside the store. She would tell her son to stay with his sister and wait. It should be noted, some articles state he had a bag of jelly beans with him. Although this is something parents would never do today, it was a common practice in the 1950s to leave your children lined up outside the store while you went in and did your shopping. It was a different time and parents did not fear the worst would happen, because it seemingly never did. Marilyn claimed she was inside no more than ten minutes when she came out to find her son and daughter were not there. Where had they gone? Marilyn thought Stevie may have pushed his sister and her pram back home, so she would head there to look, but it is unclear if she looked for them on her route home. Upon arriving, the children were nowhere in sight. It has been said in articles and online forums that Marilyn stated Stevie could not push the pram as it was too heavy for him. This poses the question of why she would think he pushed his sister home. Marilyn would call the police a short time after being home and a search for the children was underway. Pamela would be found a mere 300 feet from the store, still strapped in her pram. She was found by a family friend out looking for the children. It is unclear if this is before or after she called police. Had little Stevie wandered off with his sister in her pram, somehow pushing it to where she was found, and then something caught his eye as it was Halloween and there were decorations out and possibly people handing out candy? Did someone offer little Stevie candy and he went willingly with them? As time has gone on, it seems unlikely the answers to this will come to light. Police and military, along with civilians, would look for 28 hours before calling off the search on November 1st for Stephen. The police would say this was a clear case of kidnapping. Marilyn would state in articles she believed a mother who lost a child or could not have one had taken her son. This would pose the question, why not take Pamela when she was younger? Did whoever took Stevie want a boy, or possibly planned on taking both children and decided against it for reasons unknown? 
It is possible. Jerry was set to be discharged from the Air Force shortly after Stevie went missing. The family would move back to their home state of Iowa. Many thought this odd as their son was missing and you move across the country without knowing what happened to him. Most would have stayed put. The police would look into the parents, but it seemed nothing came of this, as police believed someone abducted Stevie that day. But others in the neighborhood were not so sure. The woman who lived in the apartment next to the Damons would be interviewed later on in life. A link will be in the description box below. She would say Stevie was always crying and Marilyn was always yelling at him for something. She claims that at two years old, if Stephen soiled his diaper, which was cloth, he was made to clean it, not his mom. She would tell of her daughters crying because they could hear Stephen crying all night and yelling for Marilyn, and it was keeping her children up. The neighbor's husband worked on the base with Jerry, and she would tell her husband he should report the abuse Stevie was receiving to the base chaplain. Her husband would report the abuse, and both he and Jerry were called into the chaplain's office, where the allegations were told again. The chaplain would respond by saying, where I come from, we mind our own business, which is absurd. Had something been done when this abuse was reported, could Stevie still be here? Many believe so. The neighbor would go on to state she believes that Marilyn had something to do with Stephen's disappearance, saying she began to smell something awful coming from the Damon's home and believes it was the smell of death, as a nurse friend of hers was over one day and told her that was what the smell of death smelled like. The Damon home, to my knowledge, was never searched by police. Could little Stevie have been in there and no one knew? Did he even make it to the store that day? According to the neighbor, she states she saw little Stevie and Pamela outside of the store, and Stevie had a bag of jelly beans. She also said about two hours later, Marilyn came to her and told her Stephen was missing. She would tell her husband, who would join the search party looking for Stevie, he would be in the car with the chaplain, and he turned to him and said, Remember what I reported to you? The chaplain would remain quiet. Some people reported they had not seen Stevie in three days before he went missing. This is unconfirmed and conflicts with the next-door neighbor's account. Was Stevie being abused by his mother? The neighbor is not the only one who thinks this was happening, as Marilyn would often take the kids to the park located close by, and one day she hauled off and hit little Stevie. It is unknown what for, but there was said to be several witnesses to this. However, the neighbor is the only one who can confirm it. Jerry and Marilyn would go on TV and make pleas for whoever took Stevie to return him safely and make sure while they had him to take care of him and give him his medication. It was said Stephen was being treated for a growth on his kidney and suffered from anemia. All the medication he was on could be bought over the counter at this time. Two years would go by with no leads until a boy was found in a bassinet box purchased from J.C. Penney's. The boy was found in the woods by a college kid out chasing a rabbit, which is a bit odd, as he says he pulled over to chase the rabbit as he did not want it to get stuck in a trap that he knew hunters kept in the area. However, he did not report the body right away, as he was scared police would believe he was involved. Another man would come forward and claim he had found the body several days before the college kid had, and he had not reported it for the same reason he didn't want to be blamed. It is still so odd as to why these two men would not report this. Some online speculate they could have been involved. The boy fit the description of Stephen Damon, and his parents would fly out to Pennsylvania, only to discover the child had no broken left arm fracture that had healed and no birthmark. Also, when Stephen was born, his footprints were taken and the boy found did not match. Years later, DNA would confirm the boy in the box was no match for little Stevie. This would take a toll on the Damon's marriage, and they would divorce in 1957. Marilyn would get custody of young Pamela. It should be noted it was said she was also pregnant at the time, but this cannot be confirmed. Jerry would stay in Iowa on the family farm and go on to remarry and have two more sons. It is unclear what his relationship with Pamela is. Marilyn would go on to get remarried and divorced and have two more sons, one of which would pass away in 1991. It is unclear how he died. However, some online sleuths believe he may have taken his own life. In 2009, a man would come forward and contact police saying he believed he was Stephen Damon. 
He would tell police on his mother's deathbed. She had said something that made him believe she was not his real mother. John Robert Barnes would write a letter to Pamela and even head out to Iowa to meet Jerry as he believed he was Stephen. He had a scar on his chin and a mole-like birthmark on his calf. John said he did not look like the rest of his family growing up, and this caused him grief. After his mother had passed, he looked up missing children cases from the 1950s and read about Stephen and thought how much he looked like him and even shared birthmarks and scars. He was convinced. The man that raised him would go on TV and say it was nonsense, he was not abducted and he belonged to him, as he was in the delivery room when he was born and he was no kidnapper. John believed he was Stephen so much it put a strain on the relationship between him and his family, and he is no longer in contact with them. His own daughter recalls thinking how odd it was her dad was claiming to be this boy who went missing in the 1950s. Pamela and John would take an at-home DNA test, and the results could not rule out the possibility of them being related. However, when this happened, the FBI would step in and administer a better DNA test, and have their people in Quantico examine and compare the DNA, as they had Marilyn and Jerry's DNA on file from years earlier. The FBI would claim that after the test, the findings were, he was not the biological child of Marilyn. John still believes he is Stephen and the DNA was wrong. There is a strong resemblance between the two, and some online sleuths agree with John and believe the DNA could be wrong. Marilyn would pass away in 2013, with some believing she harmed her son that Halloween day, and others believing she was a grief-stricken mother who never found out who took her son that afternoon. Jerry is alive and in Iowa. He still wants to know what happened to his son Stevie all those years ago. It is unknown if Pamela and her father are in contact. However, she too would like to know what happened to the big brother she never got to know. If you have any information on this case, please call the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children at 1-800-843-5678 or Nassau County Sheriff's Department at 516-573-7000. I want to thank everyone for watching again. Please like this video, share it, and hit that subscribe button so I can continue helping families of the missing, murdered, and unsolved. As always, this is the Oracle, signing off.